Hi, this is Stan Houston for Interesting Ideas, and we uh, certainly live in interesting times. And uh, the sounder once again says, hey, gently but boldly, please pay attention. Little conversation point for today. Should we now declare that we are on, as I would say, set your clocks forward to Eastern wartime? That's right, Eastern wartime. Now, by the way, you have to be really, really old, or perhaps you have to be someone who studies a little bit of history to know what in the world do I mean by setting our clocks forward to Eastern wartime. Well, there are some lessons there. I think they're interesting, and perhaps we need to uh, take a time out and think about it because it has some real consequences for life in our times right now. So, the program, Interesting Ideas, I'm Stan Houston. It begins right now. My wife told me that uh, this coming Sunday we're supposed to set our clocks ahead, that we're going to daylight savings time. Well, I always think that's kind of a stupid thing to do, but uh, we do it pretty much everywhere except where we used to live, our home in Arizona. Now, Arizona was one of the few places, it may have been the only of the states, I'm not sure, uh, but uh Arizona refused to go on daylight savings time. And so uh, what was mountain standard time uh, became mountain daylight time. But to make it confusing, Arizona was still on mountain standard time, which was the same as Pacific daylight time. Are you confused? Of course you are. But uh, that's what we did. The idea was that the people in Arizona, being kind of a cowboy maverick people, decided they didn't want to do that. As one of them said, as we don't need to save any daylight out here. We got plenty of daylight. We got plenty of heat. We don't need to save any. And so uh, they, in their own way, and uh, <laughs> there may have been some objection to it. It made things difficult in some cases to be on a different way of doing things. But that's what they did they refused to uh, set their clocks forward and then set them back sometime later. I think that's probably going to catch on a little bit more. Uh, the reason for it, well, you can ask other people to talk about the reason for it. Supposedly, the idea is that if you get up earlier, when we've got more daylight, then when you go get off work, you actually have more daylight time in the evening. Well, maybe you don't want that, but that was the theory behind it. All right, I think, <laughs> but I could be wrong. Maybe you can help me out on that. But here's the interesting point that, uh, based on where we're at, as one commentator said today, when we're looking at the situation, and what we're finding out is that this is going to be a not just as perhaps uh, the Russian premier wanted, two or three days, maybe four days at the most, and by that time the war would be over, Ukraine would be conquered, and uh, they could go on their way, they could uh, be able to uh, put their new place in place and make it a part of whatever they wanted to make it, uh, either uh, put a, a puppet government favorable to Russia in it, or they might be able to actually take parts of the country and uh, bring them in and make them part of Russia. And maybe they could take the whole country and say from now on, uh, Ukraine is just a part of what it was before, a part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, part of the Russian Empire. It's back with us. And we now control it, we now own it, and the people who live there are under our 
jurisdiction. They are not free and an independent nation anymore. They are what they should be, part of the Russian nation. Well, they thought that was going to go rather quickly. Well, of course, we all know now that it's not going quickly. And in effect, if you talk about a war that is worldwide, now the effects of it are worldwide because of the energy crisis. And we're now discovering that people from all over the world are coming to actually be a part of the war in Ukraine. Uh, some of them may be on the Russian side, but many hundreds, maybe thousands, are kind of a foreign legion. They have decided that they are going to come to Ukraine and they're going to fight on the side of the Ukraine resistance as somewhat a, a foreign legion. Now, what do we do about that? Well, who knows what this is going to lead to? Could it lead to an extension of the war? Certainly it will. Uh, and it could be and will be even more ghastly, particularly as uh, the uh, historians of war all know that if it comes down not to a battlefield, but a battle being waged uh, door to door, street to street in a urban area, that can be some of the most bloody and ghastly war around. Not only do civilians and their property uh, totally damage wiped out, they are very much in danger. But having to fight a battle that way is incredibly difficult and very, very dangerous for both sides. Any fighting warrior will tell you that that's not the kind of battle that they want to go through. They want the battlefield to be distinct and clear and plain, and you can maneuver and do what you need to in that battlefield, but to have the battle being waged, as we say, uh, door to door, room to room in a urban area. That has led one commentator who I do respect and I respect very few of them. Part of what has happened to us now, we don't know who to trust because we know that the leadership of almost every institution lies. What is the truth? What is really going on? We don't know. And uh, there are very, very few people we can trust. This one, I think I trust a little bit more than most and his declaration this morning was, he says, let's not kid ourselves. We are at war. We're not just observing this war. In what we are doing or what we may do or what we have done, we are in the war. Now just let that sit on your head for a while, because what does that mean? If that means we are now really in the war... Not only will gas prices be affected, they already have been, but many other things could be affected if we are at war. Okay, what does this have to do? Well, let me tell you the story about wartime. During the Second World War, because it was truly a world war, uh, and there were millions of men and women who either enlisted or were drafted, and uh, everything, the whole nation, was involved in the war effort. Uh, one of the interesting things that you can always do, I, I love to do it as a child, I would go back and look at many of the old time and look and life, those were some of the ones, magazines during the Second World War. A couple things of interest. First of all, they were so well written. I mean, the Time magazine of the wartime was truly written for adults. The print was not as big. The stories were far more detailed and thorough and uh, setting incredible journalism standards and very sophisticated and quite nuanced. At the same time, the advertising was almost all war-oriented. For instance, there were all kinds of car ads. Well, 
You know why that was kind of funny? Because there were no new cars for sale. And so to keep people in mind for someday when the war would end, car companies would run war time. And they'd say, remember how to keep your car in good shape because when the war is over, you'll be able to have a car and then you can get a new car. But let's try and keep the car we have in good shape. And they would have ads like that. Then, of course, they would say, buy war bonds. Use the money that you would normally spend on buying a car to buy war bonds. And that pervaded everything. And in fact, you will even hear it on some of the old radio programs. Amos and Andy will be at 8 o'clock Eastern War Time. Uh, the craft drama theater, the radio theater will be, the game will be played at, uh, hey, Central War Time, Pacific War Time. Now, of course, <laughs> what it was, was it was just simply daylight time, one hour ahead, all year round. But you see, not only was it that way, but it was to remind people, even in what time is it, we were reminded we are at war. My father used to tell me that uh, one of the things that uh, always struck him sometimes, uh, because he, he was going to school and uh, was, was, was in that plague of knowing, should I quit school and sign up or should I try and finish my education? And because he wanted to be a minister, his thought was he'll try and finish his education. And then, even though he then was going to have a young son, which turned out to be me, that then he would immediately, upon getting his degree, he would, uh, we, we, he would enlist perhaps to be a chaplain in the Army or Navy or Air Force or Air Corps, it was it called at that time. So, But he said, oftentimes when people gave you rather sloppy service and you pointed it out and he said oftentimes they would come back and say well don't you know there's a war on so there's a war on was the excuse for not getting anything done or not getting it on time or on short shoddy equipment it became the ongoing excuse for a lack of service and excellence don't you know there's a war on well I think you know where this is ending because I'm just about done. Hey, what's going to happen to us? And how are we going to live? And if you'll give me just a few minutes to think about that, maybe uh, I'll have a few ideas. I'm Stan Houston. This is Interesting Ideas. Lord bless us and keep us in these challenging times. <laughs>
in putting together the podcast that we think can make a difference in people's lives. And that's simply 15, 20, 25 minutes on a regular basis where we learn how to seek the courage and the confidence to speak and be a particularly powerful person expressing interesting ideas for the common good. Please reach out to me at stanhusted at gmail.com, stanhusted at gmail.com. And um, we don't know. We certainly don't know what the future holds. We thought it was going to be better, and maybe it's not. We do know who holds the future, and hopefully, once again, we're called upon for profound trust and obedience. Best and blessings to you all. Till next time, which will be soon. Bye for now. (laughs) 